Kia ora everyone, uh, we'll get started. Uh, there'll be a few people um, popping in as we go, but welcome to uh, Supervision Structures. Um, we're recording, um, so hopefully you've all accepted that and we'll just forge on. Uh, just a few housekeeping um, things for the session. Um, if you stay on mute, um, that'd be great. Uh, I've got chat open so you can um, pop any questions into the chat function and I'll try and remember to check it along the way. Um, also, we'll kind of um, break up the uh, slides a little bit. So just feel free to come off mute and jump in and ask any questions along the way. And we'll try and get through all my slides so there's lots of time for questions at the end as well. Um, because I know there's, there's lots of tricky questions and I get them all the time around supervision structures. Uh, one last thing just before we get into the presentation is the EOTC uh, coordinator database. Uh, most of you will have come um, to this Zoom through the database, um, but if you haven't, um, please make sure someone on your school in your school gets onto that database and um, We'd really appreciate it whenever you're out and about in your different networks, um, just uh, highlighting that it's a um, good place to have someone on your school on that database. And for primary schools, it's often the um, senior leader or even the principal in a lot of cases um, that is the person on that database. It just means the comms go to um, the right person in the school. So with all these Zooms, uh, we start by just having a quick looking, look at the overarching messages um, and they are around making sure um, that you understand the procedures you're using, and you know why they're in place and what they're for. Uh, you're ensuring the planning tools you're using are current or that they do the same job as the tools, the current tools. Um, you can find those current tools through the EONS website um, and they also sit up on TKI. So it's a good exercise to do uh, to see if they match or do the same job. And the last key point is just really making sure that everyone involved in the activity understands what they're doing um, and they can um, do that competently and they can monitor along the way during the activity that things are still happening as they should be. Uh, so starting off today, we're looking at supervision structures and, and what a supervision structure is. And it really is a way of working out the supervision that will work for your particular event. Uh, how you clearly outline the roles for the team that's involved, who's doing what, and what students each uh, person in that team is responsible for. Can be really good. Um, as Gemaperium did here to actually draw it. And um, I've got an example later on, but I wasn't clever enough to um, get it into a pictorial form like she has here. But it can really help clarify what the overarching picture of a supervision structure looks like. Uh, ratios um, always come up and why we don't really talk about ratios now and we try and talk more about supervision structures. Um, ratios are still in the current EOTC guidelines, but we're reviewing those at the moment and the concept of ratios um, will be replaced by supervision structures um, in there. And in some cases, ratios um, can lead to schools not really considering the particular needs of a group of students. It's very easy um, to set a ratio and then that becomes the default. Um, and also confusion about who's counted on what side of the ratio. Uh, is the uh, volunteer who's had very little experience, what side of the ratio do they belong on compared to the very competent uh, senior student? And it can just, um, create extra confusion around how those numbers actually fit together. Um, swimming is a classic example here. Um, schools um, often set uh, 
ratio for water activities at one to five, and that then becomes the default. And one adult to five students might be appropriate, uh, you know, if they're going off to swim in a nice shallow lake with a flat bottom and they're all fairly competent swimmers, but it becomes very inappropriate very quickly uh, as soon as you have, for example, two non-swimmers in the group, or it's six-year-olds six off to the beach, um, or a student who needs a teacher aid. And it can work the other way around too, of course. Um, you know, if it's suddenly the school's uh, water polo team, senior water polo team going off to the beach, you know, one to five is probably not the ratio you would need there. So much better to talk in supervision teams or structures. So how do we go about deciding um, what supervision structure you need? Uh, the first thing is that we're planning for an emergency, not for the kind of normal trip. Um, and you're starting with your risk assessment. Um, the key word here is in the title that it's uh, a decision you're deciding it's not an automatic prescribed ratio. And it's really around uh, looking at how your supervision structure would cope in an emergency. So it's got that redundancy built in. Um, really good to start to think about different scenarios and then think about how your supervision structure would cope in those scenarios. You know, the student that has to be taken back to school the teacher that's suddenly giving first aid to one of the students, who's supervising the rest of their group and how is that structure adapting. So when you're starting with your risk assessment, you're really looking at the things that are really going to hurt you or your students and making sure you have the staffing that you can respond appropriately. And then your structure matches the level of risk. So you might need a, well, you will need a very different supervision structure if you're taking the same year nine class uh, to the beach for a swim compared with um, across the park, across the, um, the road to the park um, to do some creative writing. Um, those structures can look very different. Any questions so far? We go on to consider some of the key factors. Oh, could I ask a question? Absolutely. Hey, Dan. I was just wondering, Fiona, is like um, the outdoor instructor industry also following this, you know, supervision structure rather than ratios? Because like the outdoor, yeah, if we think of in Zoya and, and those types of bodies, are they, is this something that the outdoor industry is on board with or is this more of a eons led in sort of high school primary school led thing? Um, it's, I think it's probably fair to say it's definitely come from an educational space um, and um, certainly starting to think about it in terms of the good practice guides now which are across industry. Um, you won't find ratios talked about in there. Mm. And it's really come uh, from, from quite a way back and when the very first guidelines were developed they were developed on the back of a couple of um, different um, fatalities. And really when you scratch the surface, it was uh, assumptions about ratios mm. were a, a key factor in those fatalities. Yeah. yeah. So just, it's really um, about getting people to think um, and not just default to a number. Yeah. I mean, you can absolutely create a supervision structure and see what the ratio numbers are in there. Yeah, I'm just wondering if is this sort of something an industry-wide change that we'll see, you know, in the outdoors. I think uh, it um, possibly uh, will be. We're definitely um, thinking more about all the factors that go into um, deciding what supervision looks like. Mm. Uh, so I think you will um, see that the audit standard are still. Uh, for adventure activities still requires a, a maximum ratio to be set, but they would expect um, to see in those audits that um, within that, it's not just a default to that um, 
that those numbers, there's other considerations in there as well. So same, same consideration yeah. as we're talking about here. Make sense? Yes, thank you. Cool, good question. Uh, so when you start deciding what your supervision structure can look like, um, you can break it down and these, these are in no particular order the next couple of slides. Um, but you can start by considering um, the people that you have involved. And then these can be broken down into three areas. So with students, you know, what are their needs, behavioral health, medical, abilities, experience, competence, have they done this activity before, been to this place before, worked in this way, and what support will they need to be able to work effectively um, in this particular activity. Um, and then with staff, considering their experience, competence, qualifications they might hold. When you're looking at overnight trips or um, possibly trips involving um, changing rooms, you might need to consider uh, your gender balance of your supervision structure. And also then really making sure that your staff competency matches the supervision structure. So for example, last year for a particular activity, two staff might've been completely appropriate. But this year, same activity, you've got uh, so a staff member who hasn't been um, to that location before and a beginner teacher. So you, you haven't got the same level of competence or experience. So you'll need to add and change your supervision structure, add another staff member in, add some more volunteers in, however it can be worked out. With volunteers, you're um, considering the, exactly the same things as you are with staff. You know, what's their experience, competence, qualification? and you use those factors to decide what roles are appropriate for them in that supervision structure. Um, sometimes your volunteers will uh, have much more um, technical ability than your staff, for example. You might um, be going rock climbing and be able to pull in a Nazoya qualified parent into your supervision structure. So there's all sorts of ways um, that you can build a supervision structure for the particular activity. And then the other side of what you need to consider is the activity itself. So what facilities are at the site, the access, distance to emergency support, um, you know, right in town with five minutes um, for the first responder to come. It looks a bit different to in the back country where you might be an hour or two hours. Um, from any additional um, first aid support. And that might dictate what qualification uh, for first aid you think is acceptable for your activity. Um, again, the type of activity, and that's around how much support the students are likely to need to be able to successfully complete the activity. Things around duration include whether staff will need breaks for driving long distances or being on call overnight, making sure um, you've got cover in there for staff so that uh, they're not going outside the um, working hours required, particularly when driving. And then in environmental factors, so whether land or water activity, accessibility again, do you have to walk? Uh, can you drive to the site? Um, what time of year is it? So um, that relates to obviously the temperature, but also the daylight hours you've got to play with um, if you need um, some extra hours. Uh, so key points, um, everyone needs to know exactly what they're responsible for, your roles and responsibilities really clearly defined, explained, um, everyone in the supervision structure has had a chance to ask questions about those roles and um, put their hand up and say, yep, that's me, I can do it. Um, the communication before, during and after needs to be super clear. Again, so people um, understand what's being asked of them and their role. 
after is one that's often forgotten about, but that's really crucial for picking up those learnings uh, that feed on to your next activity. And above all, um, your supervision structure needs to be flexible. Um, you need to consider all of those what ifs. Or what if the first aider is injured or one of the volunteers suddenly has to go and pick up their sick kid from preschool? Uh, can your supervision structure uh, adapt to all of those different demands and cope? Uh, some key points with larger activities. Uh, always good if your teacher in charge has an overall role in those activities so they're not uh, assigned to be supervising a group of students but can have the big picture. Uh, really good to make sure you have someone who has that first aid or medical responsibility overall and that's an appropriate uh, qualified person. Um, particularly on camps around um, dealing with students' medication as well and having that overall picture of who needs what when um, and where that is kept, dished out, what teachers and volunteers need to know what information about different students. That's a really important area. And key, I think, to the whole thing is that you're planning for the extraordinary, not the ordinary uh, in, your emergency, uh, in your supervision structure. You need one that can deal with those uh, emergencies that you could face. Right, any questions at that stage, this stage? Right, got some tricky questions. These are ones that come across my desk um, fairly regularly. First one is around parents or volunteers um, in sole charge. So when there's um, not a teacher who's going to be there supervising as well. And there is um, some frequently asked questions sitting on our website. And one of them um, is around this particular topic. It's in the same place as you'll find the Zooms. Um, but it's all around making sure that you're very clear with the parents about the parameters of the event, what school has checked, what the parents are responsible for. Um, you are asking those parents to act in the place of a teacher in the most case, in most cases. Um, so you, they do need to have the same competencies as you would expect of a teacher in charge of that group. And so you need to do your due diligence and make sure that's really clearly outlined and understood with the parents about the um, responsibilities they're taking on, particularly when um, they have responsibilities for other people's parents, other people's children. Sometimes it's just them taking their own children away, so that's uh, another conversation as well, because you're, they're still um, often competing, often it's sports events that these um, situations come up in and so they're competing under the school name so you do still have some responsibilities there to make sure that you've really talked to and understood um, who's doing what um, with the parent and the school and also things to think about and in, in this case is um, what is the school's expectation on that parent in charge Things like letting the school know if there's an incident, um, no alcohol on EOTC events. Um, if this is, you know, these are EOTC events, so they have to match what your policies and procedures say, even though it's a parent in charge. Um, and so it's making sure you have that conversation with the parent or volunteer so that that is all clear and understood. Um, the medical um, first aid responsibility, um, that's around making sure um, you set up the structure so that uh, if that person is taken out, or the first aid person is taken out, um, that they 
that there's someone to replace them in the structure. Um, all students must have access to qualified first aid. Uh, is, uh, that's the requirements of the guidelines. Um, but what access looks like um, can be a bit different depending on uh, the location and how quickly you think you would have first aid support. Because you know, that's the kind of town example in five minutes we'll have um, first aid support or we're just across the road from the school I can get to the office to the first aider as quickly as I could from the back sports field. Um, looks quite different to um, I'm driving for five hours and then we're going for a tramp in the hills. Um, so you need to make some judgments about the different levels of first aid knowledge and the qualifications that are appropriate um, and, and ensuring that your students do have access to first aid. It's becoming more and more sort of good practice to make sure there is first aid, a ah, qualified first aid or on EITC trips. So I think that's the ideal um, circumstance that you should be working towards. Um, but there are some practicalities around making sure that happens all of the time. And then, you know, the last one again, it's the, just that point around making sure you're planning for the extraordinary, not the ordinary. In creating those structures. Right. Any questions? Someone must have a. Uh, I do, if that's all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, be because we're quite a big school and we have, um, like this week, we've got different sports things where parents and volunteers are in sole charge and things like that. Um, I always make sure the parents that we know well and that we know can handle the kids and take on the responsibility. Yep. But what one of the things I am finding is like we've got Aero in at the moment. Oh my God. Um, mm. And like I'm having issues with them saying you can't put have parent, parents volunteers in sole charge. And then I'm saying, well, the documents say we can, even things like um, I said before, you know, we're having. I'm having issues with them around basic things like um, when I've got a parent who is more competent than a, than a teacher, we went abseiling and um, one of the parents is a qualified abseiling instructor and she's raking me over the coals saying, well, why was this person in charge? And I said, because he knew what he was doing. I didn't. Yeah. Um, and, and also, I know it sounds like ridiculous, you know, the old parent who says, well, but it's a school thing. Why aren't the teachers in charge? And I wonder if um, how we get that whole competency versus ratio thing out there saying, well, to me, it's common sense. To you, it's common sense. And to the other teachers here, it's common sense. But dealing with the powers that be and parents, it's, it's a real pain in the bum. So how do we get that across yeah. to the rank and, you know, people who aren't actively involved in, in planning these stuffs is, because even when you go into the documents, it actually is so wishy-washy. The, the guidelines are wishy-washy. They can be interpreted any way you want, depending on your stance. And it is becoming a, a bit of a problem. And I know it's not just for our school. No, and it's not. You're dead right, Rachel. Um, so the guidelines, my, my aim with the guidelines, so EONS is reviewing the guidelines for the Ministry of Education. Um, we're trying to get as much input as we can from EOTC um, coordinators and schools and will make recommendations and definitely this area will have some very strong recommendations around it. Uh, we have also um, working pretty hard on trying to get in front of Aero. Um, it's proving you know, challenging. Uh, you know, it's, we're six months on and we still can't get them to commit to who, who should be talking to us about this subject because you're not the first school that Aero have been in demanding to see ratios um, from. So they're not working to good practice um, in their questioning at the moment. Well, no, they're not. I've had a couple of stand-up rounds with these people and it's like, it would help if Aero actually knew what, what they were talking about occasionally because it, this is their focus at the moment and it's becoming very, very difficult. Yes, and we're trying to get in there so we can 
upskill their teams because it seems to be very dependent on the aero team you get as well. Um, they don't seem to have consistency. Some teams are, yep, all on board when a school shows them how they're working out their supervision structures and others, like you're experiencing, are not. Mm. Yeah, that is frustrating. Maybe um, offline you could just flick me who's involved in your team. That might. With Eero? Yes. Yeah, okay, we will do. Thank you. That might uh, be helpful. Cool. Fabulous. Um, yep, the Zoom um, will be up available on our website. Hopefully everyone knows um, the the page you go on to to register for these Zooms. If you just go down a little bit um, further, all of the Zooms end up um, up there for viewing at your pleasure. So you're welcome to share them around. Um, you obviously then have the PowerPoint information as well um, to share. Um, I did pull together a little example, um, as I said, not quite as uh, well illustrated as Gemma's one in the um, but this is a wee example I started to pull together for a uh, swim at the beach and trying to start to illustrate how it's just more complicated than one to five. Um, when you start to look at, well, I've got three students, they can't go in the water, I've got a wheelchair uh, that um, needs a support person to be able to get the student into a beach chair and then into the water. I've got three different levels of um, competency that I've identified with kind of different numbers in each level. So this gets a bit small. So one of the things that's coming through with um, swimming activities is trying to look at how you identify and then deal with different levels of competency. So your supervision structure is um, really good at focusing on the students that really need that focus keeping them in the areas that they need to be in um, where they have the right competency for the level of water they're dealing with. Um, so in this example, um, using the three levels of competencies and getting them into um, the surf lifesaving colored beanies as a way to identify um, because they're at the beach, you know, um, some schools will use rash shirts or um, little light coloured um, sports um, bibs um, to identify different groups. Uh, it's not so great once you get water coming up around um, people's chests and shoulders, it becomes more tricky to see those colours. Um, so you know, schools could consider getting um, the surf lifesaving coloured beanies, particularly if you're in the water all the time. Uh, so starting to look at what staffing you'd need here you know, you've got your TIC that's um, got that overarching responsibility, the big picture. Um, you've got um, a volunteer on the beach with the students. They don't really need any water capabilities at all. Um, those students aren't going in the water. Um, they do need an activity to keep them nice and um, entertained and with some educational outcomes, of course. Uh, you've got your person supporting the student in the wheelchair in the water. And then um, you're starting to look at how you're supervising the three levels of competency um, from your students. So in this case, having a person assigned to each level of competency, so they're watching for their coloured beanies, um, they're doing that from the beach, and they've had some training um, in scanning techniques. That information, the scanning techniques information, sits inside a surf lifesaving resource uh, for their um, lifeguard qualification. Uh, it's publicly accessible. It's um, really clear, good information uh, in there. And there is also a, a good practice guide coming out on beach activities. It's in its last stages that looks at um, the different levels of competency and will reference the resource um, for scanning techniques when you're on the beach or in any water situation. So you've got three people on the beach watching their group each and then for the highest competency and the lowest competency group 
you had five kids in the highest competency group, you've got one person in the water in the same colour as them, um, behind them, marking the depth boundary for those kids. And you've set a boundary for them. So, for example, those uh, highly competent kids, you might say, well, you can go up to your shoulders. <laughs> Hopefully, the person who's supervising them might need to be nice and tall. Um, so, <laughs> they are over their shoulders um, and can stand out there comfortably. Then one person for the lowest competency group, um, you might say knee level for these guys. Um, they can't, they're not um, particularly competent swimmers at all. Some of them are non-swimmers. Um, so knee height, again, person in that colour, I'm marking the depth boundary for them. And then because you had 15 in that middle competency group, you might think, well, that's going to be quite a spread out group. I probably need at least two people marking that boundary. And then, of course, you've got the the third person um, at the high competency, the high competency person behind as well. So you've got a good barrier out to um, see. You might say waist height for those mid-level competency swimmers. So you can see how you can start to build that um, that level of uh, or that supervision structure, and you could draw that up into a nice picture like Emma's one at the start. Any questions around that example? Oh, just a couple of slides on um, EONS's website and where to find things. Um, so this is our homepage. Uh, this will look slightly different um, very soon. Um, this is the button you click. Um, to go through to the EOTC coordinator database. Um, up here in the tabs up the top, uh, all of the links we've been talking about today can be found under the EOTC management tab uh, up in there. Uh, and this is the EOTC management tab. Uh, here's where you went to the Zoom series and that's where the recorded ones sit, off to the side. Here's the... Uh, the toolkit and the safety management plan template. If you want to do that mapping exercise between the forms that you're using now and the uh, templates you're using now and what is current practice. And I just mentioned about the Beach Activities Good Practice Guide. Um, that will um, sit in, be linked in um, here as well. There's, uh, I think we're up to about 14 good practice guides. Um, on support adventure now for all sorts of different activities. Well worth popping in there and um, checking uh, when you're thinking about doing uh, one of those activities like oh, there's confidence courses, there's flat water um, paddling activities, there's um, swimming, you know, inland swimming all sorts of things in there, so well worth a look. And just a final reminder that uh, this email address here, you can send away, uh, fire me through um, your tricky questions, or any questions really, um, uh, any kind of EOTC support you want, uh, we can mostly answer those questions, or um, if we can't answer them, we can find someone who can and provide support in that way. And then the next session is looking at staff competency and some ways um, both to judge that and also to record it uh, across time. In there. Right. Any other questions? We've got 10 minutes, so um, lots of time if anyone wants to come off mute and ask a question. Um, I've got a question, Fiona. Uh, Kira to Robin. How are you doing? Do, have you had any feedback for, oh, I don't know if has, anything has come back from the ruling to, to prosecute the board of the school that had the death. Has anything come back to you from that yet or is that waiting for the charges? Uh, that, that process is still in motion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there'll be um, some learnings um, coming out of that 
in due time. So that scenario of a child at the beach, you know how you've, you went through that scenario a moment ago with um, several staff allocated to each little group. Yep. Because there is no ratios as such, and we're saying there isn't, if you said, oh, we've got 15 or seven children, let's say we put two adults on that, if those two adults don't turn out to be as competent as we thought, is that the scenario where we could get pulled up saying we well, should have had three or four or should have used a ratio? Like it's still up to our interpretation, isn't it? That's the gray area that we're, I'm struggling with. Yeah, and I think um, I will touch on that um, probably in the next session a wee bit about really um, how you're making sure and making those judgments about staff competency that it really matches the requirements on the day and that you've got the appropriate uh, experience and competence to make the judgments about the conditions on the day. Uh, and, and where is the best place that, what are others doing of the best place to record that? We, we, we've seen it in the base of the RAS form. So that's part of the supervision form. Is that still the best place to embellish that or pad that out? Uh, I think, I think that's, uh, that is a good place because it links it really closely to the risk assessment, which is what you want to do. Um, yeah. You want to think about it in terms of the level of risk of this activity and all of the different requirements around it. What so in, you've got with you and then what competency you have. So in your template, we've just got a question, you know, in your templates that we've, we're looking at. Yep. In your um, area around the supervision, you don't match the same structure as you do sort of at the top of the form with the um, the risk rating and then the residual risk rating. Whereas in the, in the supervision section, you kind of don't have that. Whereas in this of, uh, example you've just given where you've laid out how many children in each group you've got, what the risk would be there. Should we, because we're thinking of sort of using the risk and then the residual risk even in our supervision part. Yeah. Um. Because yes, you're asking for feedback yep. for the, you yep. know. Yeah. No, that would be, um, that's an interesting way. Um, Rather than just sort of writing it all down and saying stuff, actually saying, well, look, the child with the wheelchair, you know, if there's no staff, that's high risk. If there's, you know, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it could possibly be. There's an overkill. Overcomplicating it, it a little bit because you've already identified, well, you will have already identified that um, as a risk up in your, um, where you've done your risk assessment and you've used the, um, the two levels of risk and you've identified that you've got to have competent staff to bring down your residual risk. So you've kind of already identified it up there. Yeah. And then the supervision bit and where you're starting to um, identify what those competencies are and how yeah. they match. Um, that's how you're putting that control into place and making sure you're matching that level of um, residual risk. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if it helps, but for my for last year, I implemented um, our adult helpers and our staff helpers. We um, all our helpers in anything over mid risk, but definitely anything high risk is all our helpers do a parent competency form for us yep Great. um so and i have the staff competency form yep so any um and one of the one of the things i've put in there is if people say they're competent in this and they're qualified in this and they're qualified in that they actually have to give me their qualification and that weeds out the ones who think they know what they're doing and what they don't know <laughs> um, things like that and and that's been um in all honesty it, it helps my planning immensely when i'm planning with team leaders and stuff because we can go through and say we've got these competencies we haven't got that competency and a couple of times when we haven't had them then we can go and hunt for people who do have them does that make sense yes yeah. and that's and absolute it, practice rachel well done and so it's um it was it was done out of sheer frustration actually because 
when all this competency stuff came in, we were I was just banging my head against the wall. So what and we're very lucky that we've got a couple of parents who don't even have kids at our school anymore, but who have really high levels of competency in a couple of areas and they'll come in and help with our groups even though our kids their kids aren't there. And it um in some ways it's neat for the parents too because they say oh look I can do this and I can do that and it's built up that community relationship as well but those also attach to my rams so that we can see that. <laughs> that's perfect Rachel that's really good practice um, and it's also building the picture particularly um, you know you've got volunteers that are obviously ongoing and willing to keep going both for your staff and long-term volunteers, um, building the picture of competency and experience over time. And we will talk about that um, in the next session. Any other questions? I can't see anything else on chat. Um, yeah, I've got a question. Hi, Fiona. A um, couple of questions, actually. In terms of documentation on school docs, I'm presuming um, everything we download from there is automatically updated to current, um, to meet current requirements, right? Yes, they, they link to the EONS um, toolkit. Okay, awesome. And the second question, I think yep. I think Daniel may have touched on this a bit. So outside agencies, so we've got a camp coming up um, where obviously our ratio is, is, is pretty low for overnight stay just because the number of beds that are available. Yep. Um, but we're presuming, or should I presume, that their RAMS meets current requirements and they've done all the... Um, necessary risk assessment into I mean they obviously send us their risk assessment but um, are we just presuming that their competencies are up to that standard and they've they would have done all that um, measure and judgment in that sense because there's only so many adults we can actually provide in those situations so obviously that's tricky for us yeah so yeah um, it's all about being really clear on the relationship between the school systems and the providers systems and who has primary responsibility. Um, there's some good questions you can ask um, the provider. Um, you can firstly ask if they're audited. Um, and if they, if they hold an audit and can give you a, um, their certification number, um, then um, there's a website, a register of providers that you can check um, if uh, they are registered for uh, venture activities. Um, and then that gives you some assurance that the systems have been through a process and had a robust check on those. Uh, doesn't mean all the activities that they will be running for you will necessarily have been audited. Um, so that's a really good question to ask. Have you been audited? Are all the activities that you are running for us or helping us run um, covered in that audit? And then it's making sure you're getting enough um, information and they're answering enough of your questions um, to assure yourself that they um, know what they're talking about and um, they understand what you're asking them. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And, and you can always ask about what qualifications and competencies mm. staff hold as well. That's really good. Yeah. And then you get into the um, child protection side of course as well and asking lots of questions. The form six of the external provider form um, in, the, in the toolkit is a really good guide um, even if you don't use it as a form that you sign off with a provider but it can guide a conversation that you have with them and yeah. so you're just making sure you've got a record of that information flow. Even if it's in emails um, that's fine you know just collect and keep what you've asked them along the way and what they've provided you as a package. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Just out of interest, is anyone else, is anyone still vetting volunteers? Because I know that it, um, the guidelines changed that we didn't have, that schools no longer had to vet volunteers, thank God. Yeah. The last school camps we did where we had to vet people, they came back six months after the camp, so that was always helpful. Yeah. Um, but is anyone still doing that? And is anyone else getting backlash for not doing it? It's really tricky. And that's a question um, that's on my list. 
or the guidelines review um, because uh, the School Trustees Association mm. are still recommending that all volunteers are vetted. Um, so school boards are being told that all mm. volunteers should be vetted, including uh, parents transporting students in their cars, which, which is hugely problematic for um, particularly primary schools where things are fluid and change quickly. Um, but that's their recommendation. Legislation, um, definitely uh, volunteers do not have to be vetted. vetted. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's how that ends up landing. Because we, we've put some pretty, well, they appear to be robust. Like we never have um, parent volunteers alone with children um, in transport, unless it's your own child. Children are not allowed to sit in front of the vehicle. We have all this stuff in place, but we're still hitting a little bit of brick wall. But like when we go to camp, we've got over 700 kids. So we're taking out 200 parents and it's at 25 bucks a pop, you know, and stuff like that. It's just such a quagmire and it's actually quite um, difficult to manage. Yeah. And as you say, just the timeframes for getting it done, when you have to have um, a certain amount of flexibility and Sometimes there's short turnarounds. And personally, um, and where Eon's advice um, sits at the moment is school's choice, look at the risk involved, um, look at the access that volunteers have to students, think about other strategies that you can have in place. Um, because police check is just one part of mm. kids safe. There's lots of other things. Um, and in some respects, lots of more robust things um, that keep your kids safe. Well, I've, and I got in real big trouble for one because I personally knew of this particular person, but I've refused to allow three parents to come, not all at the same time, but different things and said, no, that that person is not competent or that person is actually not safe. He had impending assault charges against um, minors and stuff. Yeah. And the backlash was incredible. And I just said, no, I'll, I'll cancel the whole camp. Yeah, no, you've got to be able to make those choices. And I certainly hope that, um, you know, the school leadership and the board support those types. They, they did back me, but it was other people and, uh, and things. So is there a, and this is where it gets tricky because being head of AOTC and health and safety, realistically, the buck stops with us. If we sign off those forms, the buck stops with us. So when we do say yay or nay, I guess my question is how how much, you know, if something does turn to custard, are we still liable? Am I personally liable for saying yes, that camp can go ahead or yes, that parent can go? Or What, what you're judged under is um, reasonably practical. So if you've um, had a process, you know, you've asked them to fill out a form, uh, you've You've been through a process of deciding whether they're competent or not, um, then um, they turn out to not be competent. But if you've followed a process and it's the school process and it's robust, um, then you know, hopefully, <laughs> yeah, you could, you could say absolutely, you'll be fine. Um, but definitely. It's about what's reasonably practical and following what is set as procedure at your school and then the school following what is current good practice. Um, so, you know, if the guidelines said you must police vet all volunteers and you weren't police vetting vol all volunteers and something went horribly wrong, um, then you have a uh, more of a case to answer. Um, but at the moment, um, you don't have to police vet volunteers. Legally, you definitely don't have to police vet volunteers and that won't change. Um, the sticking point is um, school trustees association's advice at the moment is to police vet. And, and I, I know it sounds terrible, but in smaller schools, I guess it's easier, but when you're looking at 750 parents and stuff, it actually gets, it's it's undoable. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand that. And lots of, um, in lots of cases, if you have 
on your volunteer form, the tick box, um, I agree to be police checked, um, that uh, is kind of a, it can mean that some volunteers no longer submit the form. Mm. <laughs> yeah. A bit of a self-assessment. Mm. So, so, you know, that's another way um, to put a wee check in there. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Any last questions before we say ka kite? Just want to say thanks, Fee. Good to see you. Um, I've got a bus to move and I'll hopefully make your September meeting okay. Zoom. Yep. Cheers. Thanks, Bridge. Remember, they're all recorded, so you're absolutely willing to share and any questions at any time um, to that email address. Always happy um, to get your questions and hopefully we'll see some of you next month. Thank you, Fiona. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Fiona. Awesome again. Lovely. Yeah, have a nice night, everyone.